Hi, my name is Aaron Feinstone. I'm, a, I'm an orthopedic surgeon and I'm going to discuss with you the topic and history of dry needling. Muscles are the largest organ in the body, composing about 40% of the total body weight. Even though, as Negev stated earlier, they cause a considerable amount of musculoskeletal pain in the body, no medical speciality is associated with their treatment or research. Goers was probably the greatest new clinical neurologist of all times. Apart from other things, he invented the hemoglobinometer in 1888. Regarding his pioneering work in musculoskeletal pain, he recognized the importance of nerve supply to muscles in pain pathology. He thought the source of pain pain was an inflammatory process and he calls it sciatic neuritis. We now know that that's probably not correct. He introduced the term fibrositis for the common but idiopathic localized uh, form of muscular rheumatism, which we now call myofascial pain. And he also noted that NSAIDs don't do much good for myofascial pain. The next pioneer of myofascial pain was Sir Thomas Lewis. He was a cardiologist, and he got into this field when he was called to treat many, many soldiers who were retreating from Mons in World War I with chest pain. In the end, about 70,000 soldiers were discharged from the British forces in World War I because of cardiovascular problems, but he managed to stay, leave 70,000 serving, and for that he became a knight. He was the first to term the phrase clinical science. He was one of the first promoters of controlled studies. He described the H substance, and he worked with Kelvin on pain referral patterns. Terms like hyperalgesia, nocifensa tenderness, and erythralgia were term, coined by him. The next pioneer, probably the first one to do some really serious work in, in uh, myofascial pain, was Jonas Kelvin. He was the first professor in rheumat of rheumatology in the world. He worked in Manchester. And he first of all described some clinical cases that he treated. His first case was a 41-year-old builder. He had, six, had pain for six months in his neck and shoulder. And by injecting Novocaine into the muscles, he managed to get complete resolution of the pain. His second case was a 62-year-old potato porter with uh, lumb lumbago from time to time over the past 40 years. In the specific episode that he treated, he had a tremendous increase in the pain for the past 10 days. His SLR was positive at 65 and 40 degrees, and he was very limited in motion. He gave him a 30 centim cc injection of Novocaine, and the pain was abolished completely. And the follow-up was almost insignificant. Having found that injecting Lidoc uh, Novocaine into the tender point relieved the pain, he started trying to see whether the pain could be reproduced by injecting a hypertonic saline, and he described some very basic but well-known patterns of referred pain from muscles. In this case, he also found that the pain could be segmental by injecting the intercostal spaces with the saline. His main conclusions were that referred pain was distal, distant from the stimulated point, the pain could be felt in joints, teeth, and scrotum, some of the pain followed a spinal segmental pattern, and the pain does not correspond with sensory segmental patterns. Kelgren had several followers. Gutstein, who moved from uh, Germany to England and changed his name to Good, and Kelly also uh, treated it and published articles, met, uh, Kelly in Australia, and Monham uh, in the United States, but the main follower of Kelgren 
was a woman by the name of Jeanette Travell. She came from a family who had been treating pain for many years and she started learning Kelvin's work and trying to re reproduce it. From our point of view, she's probably the founding mother of the diagnosis and treatment of myofascial pain syndrome as it is known today. She was the first woman and the first civilian ever to hold the post of White House physician. And she treated Senator John Kennedy, who was crippled from back pain. She published several work on pain patterns. One of the most important ones is the chest pain that she also noticed wasn't cardiac pain, but was myofascial. She published a two volume book, which is basically the most important textbook around in that topic up to this very day. And the diagrams in it give us a very clear knowledge of where trigger points are and where the pain is referred to. She basically gave the first clear definition of trigger points, a palpable nodular band-like hardness in the muscle, extreme tenderness at that point. You can reproduce the patient's distant pain complaint by digital pressure on the spot causing referred pain and the relief of the pain by massage or injection of the tender spot. Part of the time she worked with David Simons. David Simons started out as an astronaut. He was in fact the first, first astronaut. He went up in a helium balloon to the height of 30 kilometers, spent 32 hours there. He developed a theory called the mus muscle energy crisis theory, which we'll hear about later on today. The next pioneer was Karol Lewitt from Czechoslovakia. He discovered that in fact the effect of injecting into muscle is based on the needle effect of putting the needle into the muscle and in fact not the the uh, infiltrate that is injected. And he, he termed the phrase dry needling, which we use up to this very day. Following him, Chan Gun, who is the founder and president of the Institute for the Study of Pain Treatment, Treatment of Pain in Vancouver, Canada, further developed it. He started using uh, acupuncture needles. He gave it the term intramuscular stimulation, and he developed a subclinical neuropathy theory. You'll hear about the theory how basically all the pathology starts at the spine and moves down later on today. Another group working on myofascial pain is a group in Israel and they have recently dis discussed and detailed the referred pain patterns of the longus colli muscle, a muscle probably very important in whiplash syndrome. The importance of dry needling in 2016 is in two main areas. One, in choosing wisely, in not doing unnecessary tests. We have a high prevalence of musculoskeletal complaints in the population, a low level of understanding of musculoskeletal complaints, both in the public and of clinicians, there's an abundancy and availability of more and more diagnostic tests. There's a high public demand for these tests. And there's also a high rate of false positive results when not indicated wisely. We need to empower primary practitioners with tools to enable them to communicate with their patients regarding musculoskeletal complaints with knowledge and with touch. And by these, they will be able to prevent the use of unnecessary tests. Touch, in fact, is our emblem in the Israel Society of Musculoskeletal Medicine. A question that comes up very often is how is this related to Chinese medicine? Chinese medicine has several aspects. One of them is the traditional acupuncture based on 12 meridians, the qi pathways in the body divided into yin and yang, known, and the points on them known as acupoints. Myofascial pain treatment is not related to these at all. Another field in, my, in Chinese medicine is the ashi points. Ashi translates to ah, yes. 
and these are closely related to the myofascial trigger points. There must have been many Chinese who put many needles into many Chinese, and obviously they found from trial and error uh, how to treat people with myofascial pain. Even though the pain points are correlated quite well, they have not been studied with modern tools up till recently, and the referred pain patterns are not as well developed as those done by Travel. The Chinese sometimes use augmentation, which could be electro electroacupuncture or moxibustion, heating the needles with some sort of uh, burning. Uh, the, the electropuncture is sometimes used by modern myofascial pain treatment. The moxibustion is not. Thank you.